Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel right here on YouTube. So welcome to my channel right here on YouTube. Uh, I am Shirley. So welcome to my YouTube channel. I have four channels here on YouTube. Uh, all my channels will be geared toward uh, business, uh, accounting, law. Uh, I'll be bringing information on ancient philosophers ancient philosophers, law terms, uh, legal issues in the news, you know, current events, current events on legal uh, cases in the news. Uh, but today I just want to um, go over some countries and, you know, look at their legal systems. I want to look at their legal systems. And some of my uh, videos will be uh, business, uh, like I said, business, law, ancient philosophers, um, law terms. So basically business, law, accounting, ancient philosophers, and everything will be legally based. So, you know, but today I just want to go over a few little, um, uh, not a few little, but a few countries, I would say. I want to go over a few countries and I want to look at their legal system because I'm, I'm recording right here from the uh, United States of America. So I want to, um, look at other countries' legal systems and see what are the differences between their legal system and the United States legal system. But um, first I just want to go over a passage in my book. Uh, it's a book that I, I had to uh, purchase when I was in college. It's called Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. Now, my opinion, I feel that we are all teachers because uh, when people come, when people come into our lives, people cross our path, they learn something. They learn something, we learn something from them. So I, I feel that we all, even though we're not in a classroom, uh, you know, teaching, we're not in the classroom teaching, we're not in the college classroom, elementary school, uh, you know, standing up teaching, but right here on my YouTube channel, to me, this is also teaching. I'm bringing you information. I'm bringing you information that I learned when I was in college. I'm bringing you information that I learned from the streets. I'm bringing you information I learned from my family, my friends. So becoming a critically reflective teacher, this should apply to everyone. Because like I said, everybody that you uh, come in contact with, they're going to learn something from you. You'll learn something from them, and they're going to learn something from you. So we don't have to only just be in the classroom and say, you know, we'll get certified, you're a teacher, elementary school teacher, or college teacher. Uh, but it's called uh, being a critically reflective teacher. And so I just want to go over a few little things in chapter one before I go into the terms. These are the, these terms, actually these are different countries that I want to uh, shed light on these different countries because I want to see the differences, differences in their legal system as opposed to uh, United States legal system. So what it means to be a, a critically reflective teacher. We teach to change the world. The hope that undergirds, the hope that undergirds, oh, I've never heard that word, undergirds uh, our efforts to help students learn is that doing this will help them act toward each other and toward the environment uh, with uh, compassion, understanding, and fairness. Uh, but our attempts to increase the amount of love and justice in the world are never simple, never unambiguous. What we think are democratic, respectful ways of treating people can be experienced by them as oppressive and constraining. One of the hardest things teachers have to learn is that the sincerity of their intentions does not guarantee the purity of their practice. So sometimes when you're teaching a subject, you're teaching about something, or you're just talking, and you're shedding some light on something. Sometimes, you know, you're shedding light on a different topic, a different area, a different area of law, a different area of whatever. It might not come across to them, to the person that you're speaking to, the audience that you're speaking to, it might not come across to them as, you know, the same way that you, that you interpret it. In other words, they might see it in a different way. So that's what they're saying. It says, uh, one of the hardest things teachers have to learn is that the sincerity of their intentions does not guarantee the purity of their practice. The cultural, psychological, the, so, the cultural, 
of oh, yeah, psychological and political complexities of learning and the ways in which power complicates all uh, human relationships, uh, including those between students and teachers, means that teaching can never be innocent. Teaching innocently means thinking that we're always understanding exactly what it is that we're doing and what effect we're having. So sometimes it's like, you know, to me, I take this to say that you can be teaching it one way and thinking that it's coming across to your audience in a certain way, but it may not be. Uh, teaching innocently means assuming that the meaning and significance we place on our actions are the ones that students take from them. Uh, at best, at best, this, at best, teaching this way is naive. At worst, it induces uh, pessimism, guilt, and, and lethargy. Since we never have full awareness of our motives, motives and intentions, uh, and since we frequently misread uh, how others perceive our actions, as I was saying, they might perceive our, our actions in a different way than we are we thinking that we come across a certain way, but we might not. They may be understanding us to say, hey, oh, I, I thought you meant this, or no, I thought you meant that. Uh, since we never have full awareness of our motives, motives, motives and intentions, and since we frequently misread how others perceive our actions, I had to read that again, and uh, uncritical stance toward our practice sets us up for a lifetime of frustration. Nothing seems to work out as it should. Our continuing inability uh, to control what looks like chaos becomes, to our eyes, evidence of our incompetence. The need to break this vicious cycle of innocence and blame is one reason why the habit of critical reflection is crucial for teachers' survival. Without a critically reflective stance toward, toward, what, we, toward what we do, we tend to accept the blame for problems that are not of our making. Of our, make, of our own making. We think that all resistance to learning displayed by students is caused by our own insensitivity of unpreparedness. We read poor evaluations of our teaching, often written by only a small minority of our students, and immediately conclude that we're hopeless failures. We become depressed when we're uh, ways of behaving towards students and colleagues that we think are democratic and respectful are interpreted as aloof or manipulative. A critical, critically reflective uh, stance toward our teaching helps us avoid these traps of demoralization and self-laceration. Uh, it might not win us easy promotion uh, or bring us lots of friends, but it does enormously increase the chance that we will survive in the classroom with enough energy and sense of purpose to have some real effect on those we teach. So in other words, when you're giving out information and you're teaching, even if you're teaching, even if you're not, you definitely want to um, know that you're, have, that, that you're having some type of effect, you know, some type of effect on those that you are shedding light. Uh, you're enlightening somebody, you're shedding light on this topic, so you want to know that you have you have some effect on that person, or though you know your classmates, your classmates, not your, your students, your friends, yeah, your classmates. It could be your classmates, you know, your friends, uh, your students. It depends. Like I said, you you know you have a friend that you know you're sitting around talking, and you just shed light on certain topics. You know, not necessarily mean that you have to be standing up in front of the classroom uh, teaching this or teaching that. I think we all can be critically reflective teachers. Uh, reflection as hunting assumptions. Critical reflection is one, one particular aspect of a larger process of reflection. To understand critical reflection properly, we need first to know something about the reflective process in general. Uh, assumptions, are the, assumptions are the taking for granted beliefs about the world and our place within it that seem so obvious to us not to need not to need stating explicitly. Uh, in many ways, we are we are our assumptions. We are our own assumptions. Assumptions give meaning and purpose to who we are and what we do. So, in other words, assumptions give to me give meaning to who we are. Sometimes you can be you can encounter somebody, be around somebody, and you can 
assume that they are this way. You can assume that they they took from their passage or their learning experience. They took a certain something they took away from it, but you can assume that they took that away, but they may not have. They might have read into it a different way than you did. <laughs> It says, who wants to clarify uh, and question assumption uh, she or he has lived by for a substantial period of time, only to find that they don't make sense? What makes the process of assumption hunting particularly complicated is that assumptions are not all of the, all of the same character. I find it useful to distinguish between three broad categories of assumptions, uh, paradigmatic, prescriptive, and causal. So we have a para. para Paradigmatic uh, assumptions are the hardest of the three kinds of on a kind of the three are hardest hardest of the three kinds to uncover. So they talk about three types of uh, assumptions. So it said the paradigmatic assumptions, and they talk about the pre prescriptive assumptions and the causal assumptions. So the causal assumptions help us understand how different parts of the world work and the conditions under which processes can be changed. They are usually stated in predictive terms. An example of, uh, of a causal assumption is that if we, if we use learning contracts, this will increase students' self-directedness. -direct Another is that uh, if, we make mis mistake, if we make mistakes in front of students, this creates a trustful environment for learning in which students feel free to make errors with no fear of, of censure or embarrassment. So in other words, you're teaching or you're giving a lecture, you're teaching or you're just, you know, shedding some light on the topic. Like, like I say, you might not even have to be a teacher. But they, if uh, somebody that's listening to you or that you, somebody's listening to you, give that particular information and you make a mistake, then they don't feel so bad because they feel, you know, they may feel that uh, making mistakes is a part of life. Yeah, because it says, um, this creates a trustful environment for learning in which students feel free to make errors with no fear of censure or embarrassment. So they won't feel embarrassed. They see you make a mistake as a teacher or as someone that's just, you know, that I'm learning from. They see you making a mistake, then they, they don't feel so bad. Uh, they don't feel, uh, they might not feel embarrassed to, you know, make a mistake because they probably feel that, hey, that's a part of life. We all, we all are going to make mistakes. And then we have, uh, just trying to pick out a few important passages. What makes reflection critical? One of the, one of the consequences of a concept's popularity is an increased uh, malleability in its, in its meaning. Uh, as interest in reflective practice has widened, so have the interpretations given to it. Uh, it says, Smith, 1992, and Zechner, 1994, have both pointed out that the concept becomes meaningless if people use it to describe any teaching they happen to like. So if they describe any teachings that they happen to like, so they said, they have, they said these two people, Smith and Zechner, they pointed out that the concept becomes meaningless if people use it to describe any teaching they happen to like. Uh, in, in Zechner's words, it has come to the point now where the whole range of beliefs about teaching, learning, schooling, and the social order have become incorporated into the discourse about reflective practice. Everyone, no matter what his or her uh, ideological, I, ideo, no, ideological orientation has jumped on the bandwagon at this point and has committed his or her energies to furthering some version of reflective teaching. Reflection is not, by definition, critical. It is quite possible to teach reflectively uh, while focusing solely on the, the nuts and bolts of classroom process. It says, uh, for example, we can reflect about the timing of coffee breaks, uh, whether to use blackboards or flip charts, the advantages of using a liquid crystal display panel over previously prepared overheads or how rigidly we stick to a deadline for the submission of students' assignments. So it says critical reflection as elimination of power. So I'm trying to find the important points. Okay, teachers at, teachers at one with the students. Teachers committed to working 
Democratic as they often declare their at one with students, believing themselves and their students to be moral equals. They, uh, they like to say to them, I'm no different from you, so treat me as your equal. So that's the teacher talking to the students. Act as if I wasn't a teacher, but a friend. The fact that there's a temporary imbalance between us in terms of how much I know about this subject is really an accident. We're, we're co-learners. Co we are co-learners. Oh, co we are co-learners and co-teachers, you and I. However, culturally learned habits of reliance on or hostility toward authority figures, especially those from the dominant culture cannot so easily be broken. Like it or not, in the strong hierarchical culture of higher education, uh, with its power imbalances and its clear uh, demar demarcation of roles and boundaries, teachers cannot simply wish away students' perception of their superior status. So in other words, teachers can't, they can't just wish away their perceptions, the students' perceptions of them so the teacher stands up there teaching, you know, on certain or something, some, uh, you know, whatever instruction that she's given in the classroom. So she, the teacher, cannot. Well, she is. She wants the student to perceive her in a certain way. So like me, when I'm standing up here talking on my YouTube channel, I want you to perceive me in a certain way, but you may not. You may not perceive me in a certain way. It says the teacher is fly on the wall. Teachers committed to a vision of themselves as non-directive facilitators of learning. So I'm, I am a facilitator of learning. So I'm standing up here on my YouTube channel and I'm a facilitator of learning. Uh, my subscribers, my audience, my, you know, my audience, my, my uh, subscribers, my listeners, uh, it says, um, it says, um, Teachers committed to a vision of themselves as non-directive facilitators of learning. So we are teachers are facilitators of learning, or as resource people present only to serve needs defined by students. Uh, often adopt a fly on the wall approach to teaching. Fly on the wall approach to teaching. So they will put students into groups, give only minimal instructions about what hap what should happen, and then retreat from the scene to let students work as they wish. However, this retreat is only partial. Teachers rarely leave the room for long periods of time. Instead, they sit at their desk or off in a corner observing groups uh, uh, get started on their projects. For students to pretend uh, that a teacher is not in the room is almost impossible. Yeah, so in other words, you give your students, you give your students an assignment, but you sit off in a corner somewhere. But right, you really, you say, hey, look, um, I'm gonna put y'all in groups. I'm gonna give y'all this assignment. But then, you know, you as a teacher, you sit on to the side, but you like just a fly on the wall. You're wondering what they, they're in groups, but you're wondering what they're saying. You're wondering what are their perceptions of you as the teacher. So, a teacher cannot be a fly on the wall if that means being an unobtrusive observer. Uh, if you say nothing, this would be interpreted either as, as a withholding of approval or as tacit agreement. Students will always be wondering what your opinion is about what they're doing. Yep, students are always going to be opinionated to, you know, feel that you wonder what they're doing. Better to give some brief indication of what's on your mind than to have students obsessed with whether your silence means disappointment or, or satisfaction with their efforts. Critically reflective teachers, so that's the name of the topic and the name of the book. Critically reflective teachers will make sure that they find some way of regularly seeing what they do through students' eyes. So the teachers want to see what uh, what they are teaching. I guess is it a benefit to the students, and how how in other words, how is the student perceiving you as a teacher? You know, you want to look through the students' eyes. You want to know how they perceive you how they perceive you and your teaching, uh, I guess I would say your teaching, how you teach. So we, we teach, you know, teachers may teach in different ways. You know, you might have a teacher that teach one way. She might teach with a certain, uh, you know, certain tools, certain instruments to, you know, to get the uh, students 
excited about learning. Then you might have another teacher that may teach us another way. So that's how that may go. So I heard, or well, I've seen some teachers, they, they, they help the students learn these little rap songs and they teach them, you know, that way. They learn rap songs, they put the, they put the whatever the whatever the topic is that they want to, you know, teach the student, whatever information they want to teach the student, whatever topic they're talking about, sometimes they put it in the rap song. So there's different ways that teachers can uh, teach. So uh, teachers sometimes speak of their work as a vocation and thought, thought of, of this way, teaching is a calling distinguished by selfless service to students and educational institutions. That teachers sometimes eagerly accept concepts of vocation and conscientiousness to justify their taking or backbreaking loads is evident from uh, Campbell and Neal's studies. So they have a study. Campbell and Neal's study, 1994, 1994 A and 1994 B of teacher's work. So that's a good study to look up. A sense of calling becomes a sense of calling becomes uh, distorted to mean that teachers should deal with larger and larger and larger numbers of students regularly, teach overload courses, serve on search alumni and library committees, generate external uh, funding by winning grant monies, and make occasional forays into scholarly publishing. So teachers. Teachers who take the idea of vocation as an organizing concept for their professional lives may start to think of any may start to think of any day on which they don't they don't come home exhausted as a day wasted, or at least a day when they have not been all that they can be. So let me see. Let me see if I can find some other important. Uh, so that was just then. It's critically reflective. It said, "Why is critical reflection important?" Given that critical reflection entails all kinds of risks and complexities, that has to be some compelling reason why anyone would choose to begin the critical journey. Few of us are likely to initiate a project that promises enlightenment, uh, enlightenment only at the cost of torture. The choice to become critically reflective will be made only if we see clearly that it is in our own best interest. Otherwise, given the already overcrowded nature of our lives, why should we bother to take this activity seriously? I believe there are six reasons why learning critical reflection is important. It helps us take informed uh, actions. It helps us develop a rationale for practice. Uh, it helps us avoid self-laceration. Uh, it grounds us emotionally. It, it enlivens our class. Oh, all of us enliven. It enlivens our classroom. It increases democratic trust. So let's see what it says about the is, is enlivens our classroom. So being a critically reflective teacher so the, those were the six things that say are important. These are the six things that are important. This is number five right here. It enlivens, it enlivens our classroom. Classroom. It is important to realize the implications of our students of our own critical reflection. Students set great store by our actions, and they learn much from observing how we model intellectual inquiry and democratic process. A critically reflective teacher, therefore, activates her classroom by proving a model of passionate skepticism. Critically reflective teachers uh, who make their own uh, thinking public and therefore subject to discussion are more likely to have classes that are challenging, interesting, and stimulating for students. So in other words, just to make the classroom challenging, educational, empowering, stimulating, uh, being a critically reflective teacher, uh, they said in according to the book that that is the best way to teach. We know that students watch us closely and that they are quick to notice and condemn any inconsistency between what we say we believe and what we actually do. So that's naturally in life. You know, you want to, you will condemn somebody for what they say, but then what they actually do. So action speaks louder than words. 
Uh, and so they all, it says, they tell us that seeing the teacher model critical thinking in front of them is enormously helpful to their own efforts to think critically. So by openly, question, openly questioning our own ideas and assumptions, even as we explain why we believe in them so passionately, uh, we create an emotional climate in which accepting change and risking failure are valued. And then it says, uh, a teacher who models critical inquiry uh, in her own practice is one of the most powerful catalysts for critical thinking in her students. For this reason, if for no other critical reflection should become perhaps the most important indicator we look for in any attempt to judge teachers' effectiveness. So also it says, uh, why is it important to be critically reflective? Say, why is critical reflection important? And another one is because it grounds us emotionally. Uh, critical reflection also grounds us emotionally. When we neglect to clarify and question our assumptions and when we fail to investigate our students, we have a sense that the world is governed by chaos. And it says, uh, whether or not we do well seems to be largely a matter of luck. Lacking a reflective orientation, we place an unseemly amount of trust in the role of chance. We inhabit what uh, Free Air 1993 calls a condition of magical uh, consciousness. Fate or serenity, fate or serendipity, fate or serendipity rather than human agency is seen as shaping educational process. Uh, the world is experienced. The world is experienced as arbitrary as governed by a whimsical God. When we think this way, we are powerless to control the ebbs and flows of our emotions. Uh, one day, a small success inflates our self-confidence out of all proportion. The next, an equally small failure, such as one bad evaluative comment out of 20 good ones, is taken as a devastating indictment of our in inadequacy. Teachers caught on this emotional roller coaster uh, where every action either confirms their brilliance or underscores their failure cannot survive intact for long. Uh, either they withdraw from the classroom or they are forced to suppress at their eventual peril, the emotional co content of their daily experiences. The critically reflective habit is therefore connected to teachers' morale in powerful ways. So in other words, to be critically reflective uh, helps avoid self it helps avoid self laceration. Uh, if we are critically reflective, we are also less prone to self laceration. So, so probably self-laceration, probably criticizing yourself, downing yourself, so to be a critically reflective teacher. So a tendency of teachers who take their work seriously is to blame themselves if students are not learning. Right, you will blame yourself if you try to, you know, teach a subject and you, you might blame yourself if the teacher, if the students can't learn. They can't learn, the grades are low from what you're teaching. So that's what it's saying. A tendency of teachers who take their work seriously, right, is to blame themselves if students are not learning. Uh, these teachers feel that at some level, they are the cause of the hostility, resentment, uh, or indifference that even the best and most energetic of them are bound to encounter from time to time. So I'm not gonna read too much of this. So this is a good little book. I just wanted to read a few little, I just wanted to bring it forward to you. So you can always look up being a critically reflective teacher, you can always go online and learn a little more about being critically reflective. So in other words, being critically reflective. Let me see what else they have. Okay, let me read this right here before I close out. What makes reflection critical? Uh, one of the consequences of a concept's popularity is an increase of malleability in its meaning and its interest in reflective practice uh, has widened so have the interpretations given to it. So what makes it what makes a reflection? What makes reflection critical? One of the consequences of a concept of a concept popularity is an increase 
malleability in its meaning. As interest, as interest in reflective practice has widened, so have the interpretations given to it. So like you're teaching something, you know, you're teaching a class, or you, like I said, you just spread some knowledge to some friends and family. So they say that being a critically reflective teacher is very important. Very important. So let me see what, uh, okay, it says, uh, I don't want to read about it. So in other words, what it means to be a critically reflective teacher, so I'm going to go back over this part right here. We teach to change the world. The hope that under, undergirds our efforts to help students learn is that doing this will help them act toward each other uh, and toward the environment with compassion, understanding, and fairness. So in other words, what they're saying, I guess, my, what I get out of the book is being a critically reflective teacher when it, uh, when it, in other words, was when you teach in a certain way, I guess, you're being critically reflective, it has some effect on your students. Your students will have a different outlook on life. They will have a different outlook on life. They'll be more inspired. They'll be more empowered. They'll be more willing to help others. And then they, they'll learn. They learn in a different way. They learn in a different way. So it says we teach to change the world. So you know, when you're teaching, you're teaching to change the world, so you never know, you know, the subject that you're teaching, the subject that you're teaching, you never know what uh, outcome is going to have, what if, I guess I would say effect, you would never, you never really know what effect it would have on your students. So in other words, you could be teaching an accounting course, and, or you can be just, pe you can be teaching a law class, you can teach an accounting class. And if you are critically reflective, you love what you're doing, you're a great teacher, you're putting your all and all into it, who knows? Who knows how that that student, that we could be two or three in, in that class, or one student in that class might say, hey, look, well, I want to go on to uh, become a CPA just by taking that one accounting course. And by you being such a good, critically reflective teacher, they wanted to go on and take it beyond that one accounting course. They want to go ahead and go further and, you know, study for their CPA, Certified Public Accountant. And just like uh, law, uh, you could be teaching a business law class or any kind of law class, uh, constitutional law, business law, uh, civil law, criminal law, and then, you know, who knows? Who knows what type of, of effect you would have on some of the students in that class? Somebody might say, well, you know what? I want to go on to law school. I want to further. I took this business law class from this critically reflective teacher. She was so good that I want to go on to law school. See, we, we teach to change the world. The hope that under, undergirds our efforts to help students learn is that doing this will help them act toward each other. Act toward each other and toward the environment with compassion, understanding, and fairness. So sometimes, Right, teaching, learning, going, I found that going to college, it gave me, it gave me a different perspective on myself, life, uh, and just on the world, you know, as a whole, you know, you, you, you learn. And then teachers, certain teachers, because you notice that sometimes certain teachers you might feel, you know, when you finish college, you might feel, you know, like, wow, I had that teacher. Blah, blah, blah. I had this teacher, I had that teacher, but that teacher was really on it. That teacher was really on it, and I really like her. And sometimes you, after you finish college, you might talk about certain teachers, but you might not talk about the other teachers. So there's a reason for that. Because you fell in deep down inside, you uh, had, you had some type of, uh, I guess I would say you, you know, I guess the way they taught, the way they taught, they feel you feel like they were really into it. You feel like they cared about whether or not you learned. Sometimes you go, you take a class, and you feel some teachers don't put their all and all in it. Like they don't give it, they don't care whether you learn this subject or not. Sometimes they go over one subject, and if you don't get that subject, sometimes they go on to the next topic. And sometimes it's like that. It's like that sometimes in high school and college. Sometimes you feel, look, you know, I know some people have felt that way. I know I felt that way. 
And I know sometimes, you know, the students may feel, hey, I didn't learn nothing. I didn't get nothing out of that class, but I didn't really like the teacher. I didn't like the way she came across. I didn't like the way she taught. To me, she was not a critically reflective teacher. It said, teacher, uh, teaching innocently means thinking that we're always understanding exactly what it is that we're doing and what effect we're having. So, right, sometimes you're teaching and you think you're having a certain effect on your students, but you might not be. And some students, you might, you might have a great, great effect on them, you know. You might have, but sometimes you may not. So that's what they're saying. Uh, it says, um, I think that's all I'm going to read. Just wanted to go over that topic, but you can always look up uh, uh, what it means to be a critically reflective teacher. In other words, you teach to, you teach to change the world. And it says, uh, so just wanted to read a little bit of it. Now I want to get into, uh, I just want to read, I want to go over some, uh, I want to go over some countries and some laws, laws in the country, the, uh, their uh, legal system. I want to go over some legal systems. So I'm going to go over some legal systems. So different legal systems in different countries. So let me see. So I have a whole... So let me put this. Let me turn around here. That way. Yep. So I wanna got my water because every time I get to talking, my throat, nose started getting. Mm hmm So I have a list of them. A whole list. I have a whole list of them. So you know. So let me see. Let's look at, uh, let me see where I stopped off at. Oh, I don't know if I did. Uh, let, me, let me start with, uh, let me start with North Korea. Let me look at the legal system. Let me move this out the way. Let me look at the legal system. I've got a whole lot of them. So let me get through as many as I can. So let me look at, uh, so let me look at uh, North Korea, uh, K-O-R-E-A. So I, you know, I just want to see if, uh, you know, I like to see what their uh, legal system, I want to see what their legal system is like. Uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, my video. I want to see what the legal system is like in different countries. So I'm just curious because uh, I'm right here in the United States of America. So here go uh, North Korea. Okay, North Korea has a codified legal system which is inherited from colonial Japan and is similar in North Korea's system. As of December 2015, there were 236 laws and regulations, about half of which relate to economic management. Uh, the foreign investment laws are well developed and up to date, and there is a highly developed arbitration system. So in other words, North Korea, they have a codified civil law system. So like over in the United States, we do have civil law, criminal law, tort law, you know, tort law, civil law, you sue for no money damages, criminal law. So those are the basics, but then I also have a whole, uh, you know, criminal law is usually, uh, is, uh, is geared to, you know, getting lockups uh, or uh, rehabilitation. But um, I have a whole list of different laws uh, uh, different law areas, rather. I have a whole list of different law, uh, law areas, like maritime law, uh, administrative law, immigration law. So I'll be touching base on some of those as well. So uh, the law of North Korea, let me go to Wikipedia. So this is Google. 
so um so the law of North Korea uh, uh officially called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is a codified civil law system uh okay let me see what else do they have it says a legal system North Korea has a codified civil law system which has an which was inherited from colonial Japan and is similar to South Korea's system. Okay, I already read that. North Korea, North Korea has a three-tier court system uh, based on the Soviet model comprising a central, a central court, a provincial uh, court, and county courts. Uh, judicial affairs are handled by the Central uh, Procurator's Office, and it has the penal code uh, is based on the principle of nullum, Crimin, sin, leggy, no crime without a law. Well, that's what that means. Uh, but remains a tool for political control despite several amendments, uh, reducing the ideological um, influence. Okay. Uh, And then it says, uh, North Korea, uh, North Korean attorneys must join, must join the chosen bar association. The association's central committee determines professional standards as well as the qualifying and disqualifying of attorneys. So in other words, you want to be an attorney in North Korea, they had to join the, the, the chosen bar association. So that, that central committee, it determines professional standards as well as the qualifying and disqual qualifying and disqualifying of the attorneys. So in other words, they had to follow uh, follow the rules of the uh, chosen bar association because they are responsible for uh, you know qualifying attorneys, qualifying attorneys and disqualifying uh, attorneys. Attorneys are not hired by individuals or agencies, uh, but rather the committee collects. Uh, legal representation requests and then assigns cases and pays re, uh, numerations uh, to the society. However, attorneys do not have a monopoly on providing legal services as anyone might provide representation in civil or criminal proceedings. And then it says, uh, However, attorneys do not make a monopoly of providing legal services as anyone might provide representation in civil or criminal proceedings. Uh, the Law College of Kim, Kim II, Song University, is the only university level institution that provides legal education. For 12 years, Michael Hay was the only for, foreign lawyer operating in North Korea. He reported winning, winning or partly winning 70% of cases when representing foreign firms. So of course they said it was one one law attorney, and he was the only foreign lawyer operating in North Korea uh, for twelve years. And then we have our law and politics. So this is a short article. Uh, so this is a short article. So let me see. So in other words, let me see if they have their own constitution. Uh, let me see uh, if they have their own constitution. Uh, This is, uh, so I did South Korea, or this is North, this North Korea. Okay, I just want to say they have their own constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says the socialist, the constitution of North Korea, the socialist constitution of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, it was approved by the Sixth Supreme People's Assembly. So in other words, they do have a constitution that says, uh, it's a, it says it's a constitution of North Korea. The Socialist Constitution of the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea. Uh, it says uh, is the constitution of North Korea. So they do have a constitution. It was approved by the Sixth Supreme People's Assembly uh, at its first session on 26th. 27, the 27th of December 1972 has been amended and supplemented in 1998, uh, 2009, 2012, 2013, 2016, and twice in 2019. So in other words, it, it, they had a constitution 
but it had been amended one, three, uh, one, two, three, four, six times. And, uh, the, and the first constitution was approved in 1948, but it has been amended uh, three, four, seven times. Seven times since then. The constitution consists of seven chapters and 172 articles and codifies North Korea's basic principles of politics, economy, culture, and national defense. The basic rights and duties of the country's citizens, that's in the Constitution, same thing with the United States. So the basic rights and laws that the people must follow are in the Constitution of the United States of America. So they have a Constitution too. They have 172 articles, codifies North Korea's basic principles of politics, economy, culture, and national defense. The basic rights and duties of the country's citizens, uh, the organization of the North Korean government, the country's national symbols. North Korea is also governed by the ten principles for the establishment of a monolithic, monolithic ideological system, uh, which some claim have come to supersede the Constitution and in practice serve as the supreme law of the country. Yes, the Constitution is the supreme uh, law of the country. This is a long article right here. But it says, um, North Korea began to draft uh, its first constitution following the convention of the, North, of the South Korea, South Korean Interim Legislative Assembly on December 12, 1940, 1946, which began to draft an interim constitution for South Korea and the failure, failure to establish a unified provisional government in Korea due to the collapse of the U.S.-Soviet Joint Commission on October 21st, 1947. So I'm not gonna read a whole lot. Then they have a, they have a socialist constitution. See, so I guess that's what it's called, the socialist constitution. North Korea began drafting the present socialist constitution as there was a need to set into law to expand these socialist policies and the political, economic, and social changes in the country which are no longer being reflected in the 1948 Constitution. So they made a whole lot of amendments to their Constitution. They said the need for a new Constitution had been discussed since the mid-1960s. In the 70s, the creation of a new Constitution was made into an urgent matter. And it says the Socialist Constitution of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea consists of a preamble and 172 articles organized into seven chapters. They had a preamble in chapter one, this uh, chapter one of the constitution is politics. And then they have chapter two is the economy. Chapter three is culture. So it's just, chapter three is the culture, which they talking about article 39 states that uh, North Korea has a uh, socialist culture, which in article 40 states to be training uh, the people into builders of socialism. So then they have chapter four, national defense, chapter five, fundamental rights and duties of the citizens. Chapter six, they had a state organization. So that's, that's something normal that would, you know, you would think that would be in the constitution. Then chapter seven, the emblem, flag, anthem, and the capital. Uh, then they have amendments, 1992. It said according to chapter six, section one, article 97, the Socialist Constitution of the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea, the Constitution can be amended through the approval of more than two-thirds of the total number of deputies in the Supreme People's uh, Assembly. 1992, the Socialist Constitution of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has first amended at the first, was first amended, amended at the third session of the Ninth Supreme People's Assembly on April 9, 1992. So they have, you know, these amendments to their constitution. They, they had another amendment in 1998. They had another amendment where they amended the constitution in 2009. See, the Socialist Constitution was amended for the third time at the first session of the 12th Supreme People's Assembly on April 9th, 2009. Then they had amended again. They amended their constitution so many times, 2010. Then they amended it again in 2012, 2013, 2016, 2019. See, the Socialist Constitution was amended for the eighth and ninth time, respectively, at the first and second plenary sessions of the 14th Supreme People's Assembly 
on April 11th and August the 29th, 2019. And then they, that's it. The last time they amended their constitution was 2019. So that is uh, South Korea. Let me put a check by Let me look up Niger. Let me see what type of uh, And let me see, let me, uh, let me go to Google. Let me ask Google, where is, uh, South Korea? K-O-R-E-A. So I put on here, done. So South Korea, uh, let me see. Images of where South Korea is. South Korea. I just want to see real quick. South Korea says it will remove. Okay, I don't want to say something about that. Okay, don't say. Oh, South Korea. Uh, it's in East Asia. So South Korea is in East Asia. Uh, the country is bordered by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, uh, okay, it says uh, North Korea. Okay, you have North Korea to the north, the East, the East Sea, Sea of Japan to the east, the East China Sea to the south, and the Yellow Sea to the west, to the southeast. It is separated from the Japanese island, uh, Japanese island of uh, uh, Tsushima by the Korea Strait. South Korea makes up about 45% of the peninsula's land area. The capital is Seoul, Seoul, I guess. South Korea faces North Korea across the demilitarization zone, 2.5 miles wide that was established by the terms of the 1953 arm armistice that ended fighting in the Korean War. Uh, 1950 to 1953. Okay, I'm not gonna read too much more of that. Okay, let me see. Let's look for uh, all right. So the next one I said I wanted to look up was uh, let's look for Niger. Let's see where Niger, let's see the legal system in Niger. Not Nigeria, but Niger. Legal system in Niger. Because I did Nigeria. So, I mean, is Niger the same as Niger? It said, look, oh, here's right here. Look, judicial system, Niger. Okay, let me see if this is the right one. The legal system is basically French. Okay, don't say whether well, this is the right one or not. Let me see. Okay, do say Niger. Niger judicial judicial system. Niger's judicial system. The legal system is basically French and civil law. So it's French and civil law. So it's French and civil law with important customary law modifications. The High Court of Justice. So they have a high court of justice, which is appointed by the National Assembly uh, from among its own membership, is empowered to try the president and members of the government for crimes or offenses committed in performance of their official duties. Defendants and prosecutors may appeal verdicts from law courts. So, so I assume it seems like they have, may have a, a court of appeals and a Supreme Court. Defendants and prosecutors may appeal verdicts from law courts first to the Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court, which sits uh, to the highest Court of Appeal. It says uh, the Constitutional Court has jurisdiction over electoral and constitutional matters. So they have a Constitutional Court. So I don't think we have a Constitutional Court over here in the United States, because I, I have never, I know we have a Supreme Court and Court of Appeals and Appellate Court. Uh, we deal with civil law, criminal law, uh, family law, 
the constitutional court has jurisdiction over electoral and constitutional matters. Right, so I, I assume the constitutional court will, you know, in other words, they have to abide by what is in the constitution for their country. So laws in their constitution would be in the, uh, the laws of their country would be in the constitution. So the constitutional document, so laws of the people, uh, the constitutional court has jurisdiction over electoral and constitutional matters including ruling on the constitutionality of laws and ordinances as well as compliance with international treaties and agreements. In other words, they deal with other countries, uh, you know, and international treaties and different agreements with other countries. The court is comprised of seven members. Traditional and customary courts hear cases involving divorce or inheritance. So they have traditional and customary courts that handle divorces and inheritance. Uh, there are no religious courts, so they don't have no religious courts. Customary courts located in uh, larger towns and cities are presided over by a legal practitioner with basic legal training who is advised about local traditions by a local assessor. The actions of chief in traditional courts and of the presiding practitioner in customary courts are not regulated by the code uh, provisions. Appeals can be taken from both customary and traditional courts to the formal uh, court system. So that is a short article. So let me see, uh, let me go to, uh, let me go to Wikipedia. I wanna see, so I wanna see Niger. So I have a whole lot of just, a, you know, just doing different videos. So uh, Niger, Niger's uh, court, I want to go court. So Niger's court uh, system. So let me see if I can find a little bit more. So they got Niger, uh, well they do have the Niger, they have the Niger River. It was solved by the International Court of Justice in 2005. Uh, to Niger's advantage. Let me see what else they have. Judiciary of Niger, let me see. So the judiciary would be the courts. So the current judiciary of Niger was established with the creation of the Fourth Republic, 1999. The Constitution uh, of December 1992 was revised by national referendum on May 12, 1996. And again, by referen referendum revised to the current version on July 18, 1999, it is an uh, inquis inquisitorial system based on the Napoleonic uh, Code uh, established in Niger under French colonial rule and the 1960 Constitution of Niger. So I guess they say the Napoleonic party, Napoleon. So they based this system on Napoleon, so it's a Napoleonic. Uh, the Court of Appeals reviews questions of fact and law. So they have a Court of Appeals like we have the Court of the Appellate Court, the Court of Appeals. So the Court of Appeals reviews questions of fact and law. They review questions of fact and law while the Supreme Court reviews application of law and constitutional questions. So this is Niger. Uh, and it also says the High Court of Justice deals with cases involving senior government officials. The justice system also includes uh, civil, civil criminal courts, customary courts, traditional mediation, and a military court. So that's the High Court of Justice. So the High Court of Justice, they have this criminal and civil court, customary court, and traditional mediation, and a military court. It says military court provides the same rights as civil criminal courts. However, customary courts do not. Well, they have this called civil criminals. I, I think in the United States we have a uh, separate, you know, I don't, I never heard of a civil criminal court uh, together, you know, but over here, this is in Niger. Okay, then it has the, because they say the civil, they have a civil criminal court. Then they have a customary court, traditional mediation, and a military court. So I know we do have military courts too, you know, those that are in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, so I assume they have 
I'm pretty sure they have uh, in the United States uh, military courts. We have a judicial structure. It says uh, Niger's independent judicial system is composed of four higher courts. So they have four higher courts. So Niger, they have four high courts, higher courts. They have four higher courts, the Court of Appeals, right? They have a Court of Appeals, right? The United States, Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice, and the Court, they have a Court of State Security. They have a Court of Appeals. They have the Supreme. And then they have the High Court of Justice. And then they, they have a high court of justice, then they have a court of state security. They have the they have just they have the court of state security. Court. Court of state security. So the Supreme Court of Niger is the highest judicial body of the state in administrative, judicial, and in financial matters. Uh, the Supreme Court hears cases appealed from lower, lower civil and criminal courts. It only, it only rules on the application of the law and constitutional questions. So that's the Supreme Court of Niger. The lower, court, the lower courts of appeals may decide appeals on question of fact and law. Then they had a court, then they had a court of appeals of Niger, they had a constitutional court of Niger. So the court of appeal, one in which Niger's uh, eight regions reviews questions of fact and law in criminal and civil law and rulings, rulings, or what, uh, rulings may be appealed to the Supreme Court of Niger. So they have a court of appeals like the United States, you know, so they don't hear the whole case, but they just review. They review cases just like over here in the United States. They review, see, review for questions, questions of fact, questions of, you know, some, if some rule of law. If some rule of law, uh, they made some mistake in the rule of law. So it says the Court of Appeals, and then it says a uh, review of questions of fact and law and criminal and civil law, and rulings may be appealed to the Supreme Court. So the highest court is the Supreme Court. Constitutional Court of Niger has jurisdiction over constitutional and electoral matters. So anything dealing with their constitution, the laws of you know the laws of the people whatever is in their constitution they have a constitutional court they have jurisdiction over those type of cases and those matters uh it's provisionally organized court it's a provisional provisionally organized court what the french legal system terms a core exception the exception it's responsible for ruling on the constitutionality of laws and ordinances as well as compliance with international treaties and agreements. So constitutionality, so that in other words, you have to follow the law. You have to follow the laws that are in the constitution. So if they have a trouble with that, or they have any discrepancies, they have their constitutional court to handle uh, those type of, uh, they, they, they have jurisdiction over those type of cases. And then we have, they have criminal and civil courts. The Nigerian, or oh, so Nigerian law is based on, okay, so Nigerian law is based on the French legal system in which investigative judges develop and bring to trial criminal cases which they, with the, which they judge. Criminal courts are based on this investigating magistrate system. Appeals courts up to and including the Supreme Court of Niger, uh, panels of professional judges who hear criminal appeals. So they have the criminal trial procedure, they have this uh, civil judicial system, customary court. So they have a customary court. Uh, it says traditional chiefs can act as mediators and counselors and have authority in customary law cases as well as status under national law where they are de designated as auxiliaries and local officials. Uh, they have legal profession. So in other words, they have criminal and civil attorneys. They titled, uh, they are titled uh, advocate, or we call them advocate. They are titled advocate, the equivalent of the French advocate. And advocate is authorized to act in all legal 
matters between his client and other parties, including representation before court. They, they do have a prison system over there in Niger. Niger has 35 prisons. Wow. Niger has 35 prisons, but these have been criticized for poor operations and overcrowding. I mean, that's everywhere, all over the world. That's all over the world. They're not going to make it comfortable for you, believe it. They're not going to make it comfortable. While citizens of Niger are provided with broad legal rights before the law, government in, in interference, corruption, poverty, and a widespread ignorance of the law. <laughs> hmm. Widespread ignorance of the law prevents many accused from taking full advantage of these rights. While citizens of Niger are provided with broad legal rights. So in other words, if you're a citizen of Niger, you have your legal rights. But say they, according to this, they're scared to exercise their right, you know, government interference, corruption, poverty, and widespread ignorance of the law prevents many accused from taking full advantage of these rights. Uh, then they have, uh, according to the United States government, there were reports of 2000, reports in 2008 that several persons were detained arbitrarily under the state of alert. Detainer, detainees involved with sensitive cases were sometimes held longer than legally permitted. Then they have judicial impartiality. I uh, think that's it. So for that one, let me, I want to see, let me go. Did I do, I oh, don't know, let me, I got to check by these. I must have do these yet. Uh, let, me, let me go to Sri Lanka. Let me try Sri Lanka. So let me look at Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Let's see. L. Let me look up the legal system in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka. Let me see. First of all, where is Sri Lanka? Uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Open University. Okay, let me see. Let me. They not give me nothing. Let me, let me see. First of all, let me see if I can find where it is Sri Lanka. I don't have a map. Oh, Sri Lanka accepting reality and building trust. Uh, where is Sri Lanka? Independence Day. Okay, uh, Independence Day, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Civil War. Uh, I know they had a problem with uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka. They did have a problem with that one time. Uh, it said the free market economy of Sri Lanka was worth $84 billion by no nominal gross domestic product 2019 uh 296 296 uh look like 296 billion 296 billion uh by purchasing power party let me see uh Sri Lanka okay don't say let me go back up here Sri Lanka, let me, let me type in courts. Sri Lanka courts, let me see. Mm -hmm. They do have a Supreme Court. So Sri Lanka. So uh, Sri Lanka, they do have a Supreme Court. It says, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, the highest and final superior court of record, a court of appeal, high courts, and a number of subordinate courts. Let me click on this one. Okay, we have uh, Sri Lanka, 
Sri Lanka, formerly known as Say Ceylon, and officially the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, is an island country in South Asia. It's in Asia. So Sri Lanka is in South Asia. Uh, let me see what else they said about. Uh, it was formerly known as C Ceylon, C E Y L O N. And the Democratic uh, Socialist Republic of Sri, uh, Sri Lanka is an island country in South Asia. It lies in the Indian Ocean. So it lies in the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean, southwest of the Bay of Bengal, uh, Bengal and uh, southeast of the Arabian Sea. It's separated from the Indian subcontinent by the Gulf of Manna and the Palik Strait. Sri Lanka shares a maritime border with India and Maldives. Sri Lanka has a population of around 22 million. In 2020, they had 22, 22 million residents, and it's a multinational state. Uh, how to diverse, I mean, home to diverse cultures, languages, and ethnicities. Uh, the Sinhal, the, the Sinhalese are the majority of the nation's population. The, the Tamils who are a large minority group have also played an influential role in the island's history. So Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's documented history goes back to 3,000 years with evidence of prehistoric human settlement uh, that dates back to at least 125,000 years. Woo! The earliest known Buddhist uh, writings of Sri Lanka known collectively as the Pali Canaan date to the fourth Buddhist council. So it's a whole lot you can read up on Sri Lanka. Let me see what they have for the uh, court system is what I'm looking for. Uh, and Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka, there's a lot on Sri Lanka. It's a whole lot, just a large article. Sri Lanka. So it's a whole lot of stuff on Sri Lanka. Okay, well they do here go some of the uh okay it says uh government and politics. Uh Sri Lanka is a democratic republic and a unitary state which is governed by a semi presidential system. So they have a semi presidential system. Sri Lanka is the oldest democracy in Asia. Uh huh. They do have the executive uh, branch of government. Uh, that's the president of Sri Lanka and the head of the state, commanding chief of the armed forces, chief executive, uh, and is popularly elected for a five-year term. So that's where they have a president. Their president will serve five years. Like over here, our president serves four years, but they can serve a second term, which would be eight years altogether. Then they have the executive, that's the executive, which is the president. Then they have the legislative, which is the parliament of Sri Lanka. Then they have the judicial, which are the courts. The, just, the judiciary consists of a Supreme Court, the highest and final superior court of record, a court of appeal. Then they have the high court, high court, and a number of subordinate courts. The highly complex legal system reflects diverse cultural influences. Criminal law is based almost entirely on British law. Uh, basic civil law derived from Roman law and Dutch law. Laws pertaining. So they, they deal with Dutch law. And they deal with Roman law. Dutch law, Roman law. Uh, I said because of ancient customary practices and religion. Uh, the Sinhala customary law, the the Thies of Valame and Sharia law, the Sharia law, those religious laws, um, I think it was Muslim, Muslim religious laws, say the Sharia law are followed in special cases. The president appoints judges to the Supreme Court. Uh, same thing we have here in the United States. Uh, the Court of Appeal and the High Court so in other words, the president appoints the judges to the Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Appeals and the High Court, a judicial service commission composed of the Chief Justice and two Supreme Court judges. 
appoints, transfers, and dismisses lower court judges. So that is something, okay? So let me see what other one we can uh, look for. Like I said, I had so many. I got around five pages of different countries. So let me let me go to uh, let me check out. I think I don't know if I did that one before or not. Nepal. Let me check out Nepal. Let me check out Nepal. Let me see. Uh, hold up, uh, Nepal. Uh, I don't know. Somebody, I have to make sure I check them all so I don't have to do the same ones over. District courts of Nepal. So, uh, the district courts of Nepal. So, they have a whole lot of courts. No, so this is not what I'm looking for. Uh, Court system of Nepal. Okay, so Supreme Court of Nepal. They do have a Supreme Court. They have a Chief Justice. Uh, they have a Constitution. So let me go to the Supreme Court. So they do have a Supreme Court. They do have a Constitution. Say, uh, the Supreme Court of Nepal is the highest court in Nepal. So, so they do have a Supreme Court. They do have a Supreme Court, uh, has, and, and it has appellate jurisdiction over decisions of the seven high courts, uh, including 11 benches of the high courts and extraordinary original jurisdiction. The court consists of 20 justices and one chief justice. Wow, they got 20 justices. So in other words, uh, they have the Supreme Court. Their Supreme Court is composed of, of the Chief Justice, 20, and 20 justices. They have a Chief Justice and 20 justices in their Supreme Court. And that's the highest court in Nepal, Nepal. Nepal justices of the Supreme Court hold their office till the age of uh, 75. So in other words, if you are justice over there, you want to be a justice over there, Nepal, you can stay there until you're 70, 65, 65 years old. 65 years old. Uh, they may be removed through an impeachment motion passed by a two-thirds majority of the House of Representatives on the ground of incompetence or bad moral conduct or dishonesty. So they can be removed, but other than that, so they can be removed they can be removed, or other than that, they uh, they can, you know, they be there until they're 65. Um, okay, so justices of the Supreme Court uh, are appointed by the President of Nepal on the recommendation of the Judicial Council. Justices of the Supreme Court are appointed from among the judge who have worked for seven years as judges of the High Court. So it said the Chief Justice is appointed by the President, as I said. Uh, Chief, uh, the Chief Justice is appointed by the President on the recommendation of the Constitutional Council. The Chief Justice must have a, at least three years of service as a Supreme Court Justice. The Administrative Head of the Supreme Court is the Chief Registrar. In addition to the Chief Registrar, one Registrar and four Joint Registrar are appointed to lead different departments of the Supreme Court and offer administrative assistance to the court. Officers of the Supreme Court are appointed by government of Nepal under the recommendation of the Judicial Service uh, Commission. Composition of the Supreme Court. So I'm not gonna read all that. Let me see what else they got. They got powers and functions. Uh, let me see. They have a constant, okay, they have benches. They said the judicial power of the Supreme Court is used through the composition of the various types of benches. They are called a single bench, division bench, full bench, and special bench. So the, the constitutional bench, 
The constitutional bench is composed of chief justice and four other justices appointed by the chief justice or the recommendation of the Judicial Council as per Article 137 of the Constitution of the Paul. Um, so they have to do, they have, uh, let me see, like I said, the different benches. They have different benches. So the, the benches are, I guess that's where the judges serve on the benches. It's in the judicial power of the Supreme Court is used through the composition of the various types of benches. They are called as single bench. So in other words, the Supreme Court is used through the composition of the various types of benches. So in other words, this is dealing with the Supreme Court. So they have the constitutional bench, full bench, uh, uh, division bench, single bench, extrajudicial powers. Uh, then they have extrajudicial powers. The Supreme Court has the power to make rules on the procedural, managerial, and administrative functions of the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, and the District Courts. So I'm not gonna read all of this. Uh, so they have a um, strategic plan of the of ne ne Nepalese judiciary. So that is a, it has second that has it has second five year strategic plan. This strategic plan was adopted by the full court of the Supreme Court. The strategic plan has defined the vision, mission, values and core functions of the uh, Nepalese judiciary, which are as follows. They have the vision, the mission, the values, the core functions. So that's it for Nepal. Let me see. Uh, let me see how much time. Okay, I'm going to call, uh, I think I'm going to do one more. Let's go with, uh, uh, I have to, some reason I have to go. Let me try one, let me see. Oh, let me do, uh, oh, let me do Rwanda. I think this is going to be the last one. Uh, let's see. So I have so many, but I have to, you know, definitely check them off. Courts of Rwanda. They got Redonda. Redonda. I typed in Rwanda, but it came up Redonda. Uh, I don't see Rwanda. Okay, I think I'm gonna end this video shortly. I got a call coming in. Uh, it's just the third time calling. Let me see, there must be something going on. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Hope you will subscribe to my channel. So as I said, I'm gonna bring you inspirational content, uh, enlightening content, educational content, law, accounting, business, you know, marketing, advertising, promoting, anything concerning business, anything concerning to law, you know, I want law terms, any new terms that you may know about that you think I need to know or the public needs to know, drop it in the comments. I, I wanna look them up because I wanna learn so much you know, I want to learn so much and I want to learn so many different terms that I, you know, because I talked about uh, broken windows theory, I talked about stay decisive, let the decision stand, I talked about uh, uh, man's real, actors real, you know, man's real, that mental state, in other words, that, that mental capacity, that mental state that you are in, that you feel like you want to commit a crime, but you didn't actually commit a crime, so act is real. And then I talked about the uh, six elements to a contract, uh, you know, offer consideration, uh, legality, consideration, mutual assent. Um, so I talked about those and I talked about uh, this elements to uh, negligence, uh, different things, you know, civil law, criminal law. I've been trying to learn so much. So I did take a business law class at Australia University where I graduated with my bachelor's in business administration. And I did my master's in information systems. So, so information systems, we learn how to, we learn all the different ways, you know, that you can bring information in to your corporation, to your organization, to your LLC, or even, you know, information into your household. You know, we all need information. Whether we're working for a big company or whether we are not working for a big company or a big organization, we all need information to run our households. You know, our households, we need information. And then accounting. 
when I first took accounting, I was skeptical about taking it, but I said, we all need to learn a little bit of accounting. We all buy homes and renting apartments and opening up bank accounts and shopping and raising our children and getting married and, you know, doing different things. So we still need, we're spending money. We still need to, you know, learn a little bit of accounting. So I know we did algebra and regular basic math and all that, but, uh, you know, subtraction, multiplication, division. So I think I'm gonna do one more then I'm gonna close out because I wanna see, my neighbor has been calling. She called me like three times and I wanna see what is going on. I wanna make sure she's okay. Uh, so let me do one more. Let me go with Bolivia. And then I'm gonna close this video out and I see I have so many different, you know, countries that I'm gonna look up the next time I come online. So uh gonna be the last one. So the legal system of Bolivia. Let me just do this last one. I think I might already did this one. It says national legal systems are generally based uh, on four systems, civil law, common law, statutory law, uh, religious law, or a combination of these. It says Bolivia, the economy of Bolivia, it says Bolivia is the 95th largest economy in the world in nominal terms of the 87th largest economy in terms of purchasing power of parties. I don't see, uh, so sometimes when I don't see, I go ahead and jump on to something else. Uh, okay, well, no, let me, let me try South Sudan. South Sudan. So Bolivia, I'll put a question mark by that one. South Sudan, that's in East Africa. South Sudan is in East Africa. So let me see what they're saying. Let me read a little bit about South Sudan. Okay, South Sudan is a landlocked country in East Africa. Uh, it's bordered by Ethiopia, Sudan, and Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and Kenya. Its population was estimated at 10,913,164 in in 2022. Juba is the capital and largest city. It gained independence from Sudan in uh, 2011, July the 9th, 2011, making it the most recent sovereign state or country with widespread recognition as of 2023. So, so they said, this is a, long, a large article, so let me just go down. Uh, between nine, between January 9th and January 15th of 2011, as a, a consequence of a comprehensive peace agreement, a referendum was held to determine whether South Sudan should become an independent country and separate from Sudan, and 98.83% of those who took part voted for independence. They, they voted for independence, so they wanted to be separate, independent, independent countries. So joining East Africa, it says South Sudan and Democratic Republic of Congo are the newest members of the East African community. So South Sudan is part of East, Eastern Africa. Uh, let me see whatever system they have. Okay, they do have government. It says um, government, the now defunct Southern Sudan Legislative Assembly ratified a transitional Constitution shortly before independence, July 9, 2011. The Constitution was signed by the President of South Sudan. So they do have uh, their Constitution. It was signed by the President. Uh, South, it was signed by the President of South Sudan on Independence Day and thereby came into force. It's now the supreme law of the land, uh, superseding the interim Constitution of 2005. So in other words, they had a Constitution 2000, uh, they had a constitution 2005 and they signed a new one in uh, 2011. So that 
the new one supersedes the uh, previous one. It says supersedes the interim constitution of 2005. Of course, for 2011, so 2005 was when they signed the first constitution. They said the constitution establishes a presidential system of government headed by a president who is head of state, uh, uh, head of state, head of government, and commander in chief, like we have over here, our president, commander in chief, uh, the commander in chief of the armed forces, right, like it is in the United States. It also establishes a national legislature comprised of two houses. Uh, a directly elected assembly, the National Legislative Assembly, and the second chamber of representatives of the states, the Council of States. Uh, and then it has, uh, I'm going to read on down. They have a whole lot of stuff, but I don't, you know, I'll try to find the important stuff. And then they do have the military. It says the defense paper was in, initiated in 2007 by the Minister of SPLA Affairs, uh, Dominic Gem Ding, and the draft was produced in 2008. It declared that Southern Sudan would eventually maintain land, air, and riverine forces. As of 2015, South Sudan has the third highest military spending uh, as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product in the world behind only Oman and Saudi Arabia. Uh, okay, let me read on down, see what else they have. They got human rights. They talk about human rights. Uh, a whole lot. They talk about the climate. Uh, they do have different ethnic groups in the, the South Sudan. Check on that. See, major ethnic groups present, present in South Sudan are the Dinka and more than one million. The newer, approximately 5%, the Barry and the Azante, Azande. Uh, the the Shilla constitute a historically influential state along the white, white now, and their language is fairly closely related to the Dinka and Nur. The traditional territories of the Shilla and the Northeastern Dinka are adjacent currently around 800,000 ex expatriates from the Horn of Africa are living in South Sudan. Then they have education. You want to talk about education. Unlike the previous educational system of the regional Southern Sudan, which was modeled after the system using the Republic of Sudan since 1990, the current educational system of the Republic of South Sudan follows the A plus four plus four system, whatever system that is. A plus four plus four system, uh, similar to Kenya, primary education consists of eight years, followed by four years of secondary education, and then four years of university instruction. So I don't know what that is for, but it don't say if that, I mean, I guess, you know, it don't say if that's, uh, you know, for a particular, like you want to go to law school or something like that. It just say education. So they have a four, A plus four plus four system, and the primary education is eight years, followed by four years of secondary education. Well, it's similar to here. I guess we have we have a we have a seven, eight, nine, seven to the I guess it's seven to the ninth now, and then it's ten to ten, ten to twelve, grade ten, eleven, and twelve, and then going to college. Constitution updates. Then they talk about the culture. Due to many years of civil war, South Sudan's culture is heavily enforced by its neighbors. Many South Sudanese fled to Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, where they interacted with the nationals and learned their languages and culture. Most of those who remained in Sudan until or after independence partially assimilated to Sudanese culture and speak a uh, Juba or uh, Arabic and Sudanese Arabic. Then they have music, they have games and sports. Then you talk about the economy. The economy of South Sudan is one of the world's most underdeveloped, uh, with South Sudan having little existing infrastructure and the highest maternal. Uh, mortality and female illiteracy rates in the world as of 2011. 
South Sudan exports timber to the international market. So in other words, they are, they're females. Uh, so it says, uh, it says Sudan having little exist, no, it says, uh, I, mean, I don't wanna read that part. Let me read, we're talking about the, I thought I said something about the females. It says the economy of South Sudan is one of the world's the most underdeveloped with South Sudan having little existing infrastructure and the highest maternal mortality and female illiteracy. So they have the highest rate of female illiteracy uh, in the world as of 2011. Ain't that something? So that's as 2011, that's what, 12 years ago? It was 23 now, 2023. Uh, so that's something, so like, you know, a lot of times, you know, some people, you know, living in the United States, you know, I don't want to, I don't like to see people, uh, don't, I don't like to see people, uh, I guess I would say not appreciate, you know, being in the United States. I mean, I appreciate being in here, over here in the United States because I was able to go to school, I wasn't held back, I was able to go to college, I was able to go over to high school, college, raise a family. Uh, start several businesses and stop start them and stop them. You know, being free, being able to do what I wanted to do. Excuse me. So, uh, you know, we have our, you know, United States. We have our, I guess I would say, we have good opportunities over here. So, you know, I'm like, you know, take advantage of your opportunities. You know, take advantage. Be proud to be an American, because I know I am. I'm just, that's why I wanted to do this little assignment. I wanted to read up on, you know, different countries. I wanted to see life, uh, what life is like in some of these countries, because you don't know, you know. I mean, I look at the news a lot of times, because I was reading up on, I did, uh, I think it was Saudi Arabia, that I, I saw all the different laws that they have for their women and their, their, their communities, their people. And I said, some of those, laws that they have where you know women can't they couldn't even drive i think they just i think they just learned i think they just um i think now they are able to learn how to drive but women couldn't have couldn't drive and it's just so many other laws that they you know they had to abide by and i said wow well, i know i've been driving since way back when and just imagine you know so that's why i say you know in the united states it's not good to take things for granted because when I look at when I'm doing this research and I see what's going on in a lot of these other countries, I say, wow, I'm, I'm proud to be an American. So, you know, so I tell you, it's just a blessing to be able to go to school, learn how to drive, get kids, raise a family, get, I got married. Uh, and I definitely wanted to go to law school that was in that was another dream of mine but i did do a paralegal course but i figured you know i just take my opportunity to do as much you know research so let me see uh uh i think this is the last one i want to do they have a water crisis see the water supplies in uh, south sudan is faced with numerous challenges i don't know what year this is but the water supply is, is they faced with challenges, although the white now runs through the country. Water is scarce during the dry season in areas that are not located in the river. I know I have some friends over in Nigeria and they told me they have, uh, I mean, the two, the, the uh, cultural differences from Nigeria and the United States. He said they have two, I think they have two seasons, rainy season and the dry season. And then uh, he said they, they have to go outside and pump water. And when they go to the hospital, they can't, they can't be seen because they have the papers. And they have, there's been a lot of lives over there lost. A lot of lives lost over there because you have the papers and some people don't have the funds to pay uh, before they see the doctor, you know. And then they have a lot of malaria over there, so just think if they have a lot of malaria and they can because I know in his family, uh his son had malaria a couple times and he had malaria three times and his sister had malaria and thank God they have the financial 
means to be able to go to the doctor, get the injections, and, you know, overcome that, that malaria, you know. So uh, I think this is it. Uh, let's see, did I do Cuba? I got Haiti and Cuba, Belgium, Bolivia, Tunisia, Burundi, Benin, I did Rwanda, Czech Czechoslovakia, where well, I say CZ, uh, Jordan and Greece. Let me let me see what Greece is talking about. Let me see. Let me see. What? Let me look at Greece. I don't want to make this video too long, but once I get to, I can be, you know, I'm a little tired, but, you know, what time is it? Let's see. I don't know what time it is. Let me see. Uh, 7.41. So, 7.41, let's look up. This is going to be the last one. What I said I wanted to do. Uh, what did I say I wanted to do? Which one? Uh, Greece. Okay, I did circle it. Okay, let's see. Legal system in Greece. Uh, CE. The legal system in Greece. Let me see. First of all, where is Greece? I would love to know. Uh, legal system in Greece. Nope, this is not going to be... Uh, Let me see, where is Greece? Well, I'd like to know, first of all. Uh, Greece, officially the Hellen Hellenic Republic, is a country in Southeast Europe. Greece is in Europe. Southeast Europe. So Greece is in Southeast Europe. Uh, they got Greek. Greek language, ancient Greece. Okay, well, ancient Greece. Uh, it was a northeastern Mediterranean civilization existing from the Greek Dark Ages of the 12th and 9th centuries. Uh, Greece, Turkey relations. Uh, let's see. So I'm typing in the courts of Greece, legal system. So they got administrative courts in Greece. It says Supreme Court. They have a Supreme Court in Greece. They have the Supreme Civil and uh, Criminal Court of Greece. Uh, I just, just, you know, just curious. Cause I assume, you know, all around the country, you know, I assume they have, uh, you know, all these countries and, you know, and then I want to look up. I wanted to look, you know, I wanted to look up some states too, you know, in the United States. Some of those states, because they have different laws in different states too, you know, and even in the country. Okay, this is, uh, let me see, uh, he said the Supreme Civil and Criminal Court of Greece uh, is the Supreme Court of Greece for civil and criminal law. In Greece, the decisions of the Supreme Court are final, just like over here in the United States. Uh, Supreme Court, so all cases over here in the United States don't, all cases over here don't make it to the Supreme Court, but some, some of them do. And so they have, see, in Greece, the decisions of the Supreme Court are final. However, since Greece is a member, member state of the Council of Europe, uh, cases ruled on by the Greek Higher Court can be appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and the Supreme Court decides that a lower court violated the law of principles of legal process, it can order the, uh, it can order the rehearing of a case by a lower court. Same thing over here, United States. The court consists of the president and attorney general, 10 vice presidents, 65 uh, aerial pageants, and 17 deputy attorneys general. The members of the Supreme Court are 10 tenured until they reached the mandatory retirement age of 67 as mandated by the Greek Constitution. So that's just a little history on the court. And so let me see. So that is just the Supreme Court. Uh, so 
So let's see, uh, let's see what how with the Constitution. It says administrative courts of Greece. So they do have a Supreme Court. So that's the final court in in in, in uh, Greece. So composed of civil courts which judge which judge civil and penal cases and administrative courts which judge disputes between the citizens and a Greek administrator. Let's go to uh, let me see. Uh, Judiciary of Greece. Let's go here. It says uh, independence of the of the justice system. It says the judicial system of Greece is the country's constitutionality established system of courts. The judicial system of Greece. So judicial is the court system. Same thing over here in the United States. However, the selection of the presiding uh, judges of the Supreme Court is regulated by the government. Manipulation of the judicial system and its decisions by each government is a common phenomenon which violates solar independence of the system. It, it violate which violates solar independence of the system. Uh, then they have a selection and appointment of professional judges. The Greek National School of Judges is an educational institution based in uh, Thessaloniki. Supervised by the Minister of Justice, it was established on the basis of Law 2236-1994 with the task of selecting, educating, and training those intended to be appointed uh, to positions of judicial officers of the Council of State, the Court of Auditors, Administrative, Civil, and Penal Courts, and Public uh, Prosecutors, as well as the continuous training of judges already in service. Uh, its operation began in 1995, and its attendance lasts one year. In order to be admitted to the school, law school graduates must first complete their internship, gain their license to practice, and then pass examinations for their admission. So in other words, they want to be a judge, that's what they have to do is a process. So it says that the Greek National School of Judges is an educational institution based in it's based in certain places uh, in Greece. So if they want to be a judge, they have to go is a national school of judges as an educational institution uh, is responsible for educating and training those intended to be appointed uh, in positions of you know of judges. And it says uh, three categories of the Greek judicial system uh, according to the Constitution. There are three categories of courts: there are the civil courts, the penal courts, and administrative courts of Greece. Uh, the Supreme Court of the Civil and Penal Justice is the Court of Causation, while the Supreme Court of the Administrative Justice is the Council of State. Uh, Greek judges belong to one of these two branches. Consequently, an administrative judge is not entitled to judge a penal or civil case. So in other words, an administrative judge over there is not entitled to judge a penal or civil case, while a civil judge is entitled to judge a civil or penal case but not an administrator. Yeah, I guess they had entire, I mean, that's understandable. Because if you're a civil uh, judge, then you'll be judging civil cases. Civil cases and uh, penal cases, but if you are an administrative judge, you won't, you can judge the administrative cases, but not the civil cases. So over here in the United States, civil law is uh, different from the criminal law. So civil law dealing over here, uh, money damages, uh, civil law deals with money damages, criminal law, in other words, you know, they try to get lockups. Criminal law, you try to, you know, lockups. So, and then we have the civil justice. Civil cases are judged uh, at first instance by the district courts or the courts of first instance according to the estimated value of the matter disputed of law, the estimated value. And all the value of the case and second instance by the court. So in other words, the first when the first when the case first starts, there'll be the first instance. Then they had a second instance and by the court of then by the court of causation, when a writ of certiorari is filed against the final decision of the court of appeal, the court of causation, the decisions are irrevocable. Right. So if they go to the court of appeals, it's irrevocable, but that's the last court the last resort last resort of the court of appeals or the supreme court but right here it says by the court of causation when a writ of certiorari is filed against the final decision of the court of appeal the court of causation decisions are irrevocable 
They had the penal justice. Felonies are judged, there, for instance, by the mixed court of first instance, and in the second instance by the mixed court of appeal. The term mixed refers to the participation of professional judges and jurors, retaining almost no difference from lay judges in this respect. So uh, I guess mixed decisions, mixed mixed opinions. <clears throat> it was say mixed. It said in these mixed courts, four jurors participate along with three professional judges. Uh, first instance and uh, of appeal respectively. A constitutional provision allows the exemption of certain crimes uh, from the jurisdiction of the mixed courts. Uh, it says uh, these courts are judged at first instance by the three member court of appeal and a second instance by the five member court of appeals without the participation of any jurors. It says, for example, the members of the revolutionary organization 17 uh, November 17th, terrorist group were judged according to this procedure because felonies of terrorism or organized crime belong to the competence of the Court of Appeal and not to the mixed courts. So it's a whole lot, you know, you can always read more up on uh, Greece. So I'm pretty checked by that. You can read more up on the laws of Greece. So they do have administrative justice. Uh, the judicial control of an administrative act goes either on its merits or not. Administrative acts of the first case are appealed against with, with the legal remedies of the recourse or of the suit, and they belong to the jurisdiction of the administrative courts, while all the other administrative acts are appealed against with the legal remedy of the writ of annulment, and they belong to the jurisdiction either of the Council of State or the Administrative Court of, court of Appeal. Uh, the constitutional uh, the constitutional control of laws uh, according to the Greek, Greek judicial system, every court is competent to judge the conformity or lack thereof of a legal provision with the constitution. And it said the Supreme Court. We had a Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court is not a regular and permanent court. Although it said the Supreme Special Court, the Supreme Special Court is not a regular or permanent court. Namely, it sits only when a case belonging to its jurisdiction arises. So like a court, the special, a Supreme Special Court. So it only comes up when they have, a, I guess, a special case come up. So it's not a permanent court. It's not like the regular Supreme Court. This is a, this is a Supreme Special Court. To resolve disputes between the Supreme Courts or between the courts and administration, this is what they do. Uh, to take an irrevocable decision when contradictory decisions of the Supreme Courts concerning the true meaning or the constitutionality of a legal provision are issued. To judge the pleas against the validity, the validity of the result of the legislative uh, election. And then we have a uh, well, then we have the proposed Supreme Constitutional Court. So they have a, they have a, a, a constitutional court. And then they have the EU law and constitution. The Court of Justice of the European Communities uh, considers the law of the, uh, I guess that's the European Union, uh, so superior to the national laws, including the national constitution. This, however, applies where the European Council has expressly legislated its particular areas. This being where treaty provisions provide for secondary legislation uh, in furtherance of the former, the Greek courts, and especially the Council of State have uh, avoided expressing themselves about the superiority of the Constitution or EU law. And then they have the constitutional control and, and the Council of State. And I think that's it. So I think I'm going to close out on this video. So I do have so many, you know, so many. So many, it's like 195 or I haven't even put it. I don't even think I have even, I don't even think I have done even uh, 20 of them yet. But, you know, and then my book right here, Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. Uh -huh. So check this book out uh, online So being critically reflective. So I just read a little bit of this. And it began, I just that was just the first chapter. I was just reading a little bit of that. Then I went into my my countries. So 
then my next video I'll probably do some long terms or I'll do some more countries so I want to I'm going to do all those 195 countries. So I want to just know a little bit about each country. I definitely want to see the differences uh, I want to see the differences in their um, their laws and how their court systems are set up. How they do things, you know, the culture, you know, learn, you know. But we have a lot I have a lot of content to gather, to bring to my channel, so why not? And this is just one topic that I wanna do. This is one, one area of learning, you know, in other words, different countries, their legal systems, their culture, you know, whatever's going on in their country. I have that, then I have legal terms, and then I have my uh, ancient philosophers that are have been shedding light on those uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you know, ancient philosophers like Plato, Socrates, uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, John Locke, uh, Albert Einstein, and then I, um, I want to talk about more, I want to talk more about uh, painters, um, you know, painters, um, artists, uh, we're talking about Michelangelo, Picasso, Rembrandt, uh, different ones, and uh, so uh it's just so you know and you know i have a lot i have a lot to um bring to my channel so we have you know we have to bring that content you want to bring that beautiful content educational content inspirational content enlightening content you know so and also want to do a little blogging you know get out to the field and you know i just want to you know step out of the box and you know do what i can to make my uh channel interesting enlightening educational uh so uh that is going to be it for today so thanks for joining subscribe to my channel and i'll see you on my next video so i'll definitely see you on my next video so you see me that's me right there that's me right there so i'll see you on my next video So there I am. So I'll see you all in my next video. Y'all have a blessed one. So I don't know what I'm talking about on there, but...